Though hardcore platformers like Donkey Kong Country have always been some of my favorite games in the genre, some days I just want to sit down, relax, and play a nice little game where I don't have to worry about making pixel perfect split second jumps with the time limit. But within this niche subgenre, one mascot stands above the rest. I'm of course talking about Bubsy. I mean, Kirby, sorry, I get those confused. Oh, what a series of games. Classics, I dare to say. Especially Kirby's Adventure on the NES, that's my favorite of the series, and a game I've always been wanting to make an episode on. But you can't really understand the development of this classic HAL Laboratory title without first learning about the creation of Kirby's Dream Land, Kirby's first outing released on the Game Boy, and it became a critical step in the creation and perfection of Kirby's Adventure. So I say on this episode of Beta 64, Let's discover the origins of Kirby as we look at the development of both Kirby's Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure. So let's start off with the big question. How did Kirby come to be? What spawned its creators to begin development on Kirby's Dreamland for the Game Boy? Well, it all starts with a 19-year-old Masahiro Sakurai, director of both Kirby's Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure, and who would eventually go on to direct the entire Super Smash Bros. series as well. When he first joined Nintendo, the company was looking to create a new game, and were currently accepting applications, specifically for a game that could be enjoyed by anyone. After hearing this, Sakurai went to the drawing board, looking to create a cute main character that anyone would love. He started off by drawing this balloon-like character simply as a placeholder, until he could come up with a better final design. But as time went on, the team started to really fall in love with this placeholder. They adored its simplistic nature, and they unanimously decided to keep the protagonist completely unchanged from this original concept. Satoru Iwata, producer and programmer on Kirby's Adventure, mentioned in an interview that when someone loves a character, they like to sketch them in their notebooks, right? That's why we gave Kirby a simple circular design, so anyone could draw him. Now what about the name Kirby? How did that come about? Turns out his original name was actually Popopo with the game itself being entitled Twinkle Popo. But after finishing said game and talking it over with Nintendo, they jointly decided that a name change was in order before release. In the team's mind, they wanted their little game to be enjoyed by everyone, American kids included. Hey, thanks Japan. So they asked Nintendo of America for any name suggestions they might have, one of which, for example, was Gasper, and it didn't make the cut. The team was hoping for a name that sounded like an American Idol, but instead went for one of them that really stood out, Kirby. Turns out it was actually the same name as an American lawyer, John Kirby, who defended Nintendo in court when Universal sued them for ripping off King Kong with their game Donkey Kong. As a way to honor this wonderful man, the team decided to name their pink puffball after John Kirby, and in turn changed the game's title to Hoshi no Kirby in Japan, which means Kirby of the Stars. And it was called Kirby's Dreamline elsewhere, but. It's interesting though, this magazine scan describing the game while it was in development actually refers to Kirby as Popopo. See, right here. It says in Japanese, Oboe Yasui Namae de Sho, Boku Popopo, which means it's an easy to learn name, I'd say. I'm Popopo. Kirby's main ability showcased in Kirby's Dreamland is, of course, being able to inhale, whether it's air to fly or enemies to shoot. But how did that idea come about? Well, Sakurai, from the beginning, wanted the controls in the game to be simple. So instead of attacking the enemy yourself, he wanted you to be able to use enemies to attack other enemies. At first, he considered having Kirby use the enemies as a football, or as some call it, a soccer ball. Basically, Kirby would have been heading enemies and kicking them all over the stage. In fact, that was the idea that they were completely set on using, up until they decided to include flying into the game. After deciding that Kirby would soar through the air like a majestic pelican, they asked themselves, how would Kirby actually fly? To which one of the members said, what if he puffed up like a balloon? But how would he do that? Asked another questioning team member. Maybe by inhaling air. And that is exactly what they did. But since Kirby could now inhale air to become a balloon, 
The next thought was, wouldn't it be cool if he could inhale enemies too? And the rest is history. There's a few more facts that make Dreamland's development story even more interesting. Like how the game was developed using this system, a Famicom merged with a Famicom disk system and controlled using a trackball. No mouse, no keyboard, just a trackball. So in order to write code, they would have to use an on-screen keyboard with a trackball controlling the cursor to click the keys. It sounds insane, but Sakurai just assumed that was the way it was done. Just assumed it was the way it was done. What? Anyway, here's a look at the dev tool that ran on that system. I'll admit, it's an interesting looking tool, but gosh, no keyboards just sounds painful. In fact, Sakurai even said that using it was like making a lunch with a lunchbox. But according to him, it wasn't all bad. It led to improvements managing the data processing load, which in turn gave the characters a very silky smooth movement, especially for a Game Boy game. Now, in addition to using a freaking trackball to make the game, to add more to the difficulty, the team only had 512 kilobits of space they could use for the game. And while that wasn't the smallest cartridge size available at the time, it was certainly a small amount of data, especially by today's standards, oh my gosh. But because of this limitation, the team used a lot of interesting techniques to save on space. Like how Waddle Dee and Waddle Doo are basically the same enemy, but with a different face. Or how Poppy Bro Senior's animation is only three frames for the feet and two for the head. And let's not forget Wispy Woods, whose only animated parts, the eyes and the mouth, are the same image, just rotated across the x-axis. All of that safe space gave the team enough room for the highly animated King DDD, which happens to be the biggest space-taking enemy in the game. Hey, you want to hear another interesting thing about enemies in this game? Turns out when you see an enemy fall off the screen or climb down a ladder, there is no collision detection telling the enemy, hey bro. Uh, you, uh, you're no longer standing on the ground, so better fall right about now. Nope. Instead, Sakurai programmed that crap in. Every step of the enemy's movement was specifically written in hex. I mean, gosh. From a programming standpoint, that's legitimately insane. But I, I, I guess it worked, didn't it? Ugh. I have to say, though, the most interesting fact in this game's development story is that originally, when Kirby died... He was going to fly off screen, kind of like uh, some other game directed by Sakurai. Oh right, Super Smash Bros. But here's the thing, even though the ideas are the same and even though both games were directed by Sakurai, he swears that he had completely forgotten about the idea when he created Smash Bros. You have to admit though, even the concept art looks a lot like the fully realized version in Smash. And finally, in 1992, Kirby's Dream Land was released for the Game Boy, receiving a mostly positive reception, with the problems mainly just being a lack of content and easy difficulty. But the positives more than outweighed the negatives, most players found the game a relaxing, cutesy platformer filled with wonderful worlds and memorable characters. And I agree completely. Now, why don't we talk about some unused stuff? The cutting room floor managed to find a couple of unused sprites in this game. One of them just happens to be an unused frame for Waddle Doo's animation, showing the enemy looking up. Nothing much else to say about that. But King DDD also has some unused frames too. These have him shown with his hands on his face, kind of like he's surprised or something, like, Oh, you found me! <laughs> and because these frames are so dark, some believe that they were meant for a removed introduction scene, something like uh, having him walk from the side of the corner of the ring. Like, hey, Kirby. <laughs> but of course, that's all speculation. Don't take it as fact. Less than a year after the release of Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Boy, Kirby's Adventure was released for the NES. An incredibly short time seeing how many improvements they made over the original game. So how did the sequel start? Well, while the team was finalizing Kirby's Dream Land, they had to start working on Kirby's Adventure's promotional artwork. It turns out though, while the design of Kirby was pretty much a unanimous decision, his color did not end up that way, at least at first. It didn't really matter too much in Kirby's Dream Land, seeing as the Game Boy didn't have any color. 
But once Kirby's adventure came into the picture, there was a bit of an issue because everyone on the team had their own idea of what color Kirby was supposed to be. Though Sakurai had always considered Kirby to be pink from the very beginning, he was literally the only one on the team that thought so. Some people like Miyamoto himself thought the character was supposed to be yellow, much like Pac-Man or Nubo. You know, from that Japan exclusive Game Boy game of the same name, you know it. Others on the team thought that Kirby was supposed to be white, which was what was depicted on the North American box art of Kirby's Dreamland due to this color confusion. But when Sakurai insisted that Kirby was supposed to be pink, the rest of the team went along with the idea, with Miyamoto even praising the color choice as a fresh idea compared to the large array of yellow characters at the time. Of all the changes the team made in the sequel, the biggest addition to Kirby has to be his ability to inhale enemies and now copy their abilities. This was added as an attempt to make the game more enjoyable for skilled players, since the original game was mostly criticized for being short and easy, even though that was actually the way it was supposed to be designed. Well, maybe not short, but Sakurai went on record saying that it was supposed to be a somewhat easy game. For Kirby's Adventure though, the team wanted to be able to appeal to both beginners and skilled players by keeping the easy parts of the game intact but adding something so that skilled players could have fun too. That something just so happened to be adding the copying ability to Kirby's repertoire of skills. By adding these many enemy abilities for Kirby to use, it would allow players to experiment different ways of completing levels. Originally though, there were actually going to be over 40 unique enemy abilities. But from those, the team only picked the best ones from the bunch, which ended up being the 25 abilities that found their way into the final game. Of the ones that were cut, there was one where you could create blocks, one that allowed you to ride a rocket, another that shrunk Kirby down, and even one called Animal, which allowed you to scratch and bite enemies, and was later introduced in Kirby Squeak Squad in 2006. Now, with this fix in place for the game being too easy, they had another problem on their hands. Players had said in Kirby's Dreamland that Kirby was just too small, so they made him bigger. And since the team decided to go to all that trouble of remaking the sprites, they thought, why not add some more moves then? So they gave him a ton of different movements and animations in order to make our little protagonist so much more expressive. Look at him, just jumping and dancing around, adorable. Another addition added to the game were these little mini-games, designed as something simple and easy to play that would only require one button to play. Originally, there were going to be four different mini-games using this one-button control scheme. The first idea the team had was to make a game to see who could press a button the most times in a short period of time. Ironically, this is the one mini-game idea that never came to fruition, but even though this idea wasn't used, it brought forth a bunch of different ideas that would eventually get in the game. After the break your thumb idea came forth the who could press the button first game, or quick draw, and then the should I press the button game, which became egg catcher, and last was the button timing game called crane fever. You know, one of my favorite parts of Kirby's adventure, and even in Kirby's dreamland, is how beautiful the backgrounds are. I mean, just look at that, gorgeous, a masterpiece. And that was exactly what the team was hoping people would say while playing the game. Since the beginning, the goal of the team was to make these backgrounds look nice enough just to look at on their own. At this time in the game development world, the team would have a specific member whose job was just to work on the game maps. But in Kirby's Adventure, they actually had a designer create the maps first on paper and then pass the drawing off to a mapper who would rework it into the game. That's what made the backgrounds in Kirby's Adventures just, oh, so beautiful. While other games had a Mr. Random Joe working on the world's look and feel, the Kirby team had artists who poured hours and hours of work into making the game sparkle in every corner. And that's what makes this game so pleasant to look at and feel so special to play. And so we've made it to unused assets within Kirby's Adventure. And compared to Kirby's Dreamland, its sequel is a treasure trove of unused graphics, rooms, power-ups, among other things. And of course, as always, I recommend heading to the cutting room floor after the video if you want to learn some more in-depth information on these findings like exact tile set numbers for unused sprites, or even a ton of unused color palettes that I'll just be skipping over because there's a lot of other things I'd like to talk about besides 20 plus alternate color schemes. So with that being said, what do you say we head into these unused graphics? 
First, let's look at some sprites for levels and such, like these unused tiles for a darkroom variation, which is associated to graphics set 2-2 using palettes 8B to 9-1, according to the cutting room floor's findings. This mock-up made by BMF54123 shows what it likely would have looked like for this final screen to use this darkroom variation. Quite beautiful if I do say so myself. And I do. Speaking of unused stage tiles, of the seven water tiles, only two of these actually found their way into the final game. Though you might be thinking that these look nothing like water tiles, understandable. Which is why we have this mock-up of what they would have looked like had they all been put into the game. Next up, we've got some interesting unused sprites for the level's hubs HUD. Due to the fact that these sprites are darker than the final HUD, and the fact that they look so much different than what we see normally in the game, it's very likely that these sprites are actually for an early version of the HUD, completely different from what we see now. Oh, and since we just talked about the level hub, I probably should mention this unused sprite of the number 7, which would have went along nicely with all the other numbers placed on the stage doors. But just its luck, there was never more than 6 levels in a hub world. That's why it was never used. A tragic tale of a 7 who only wanted to be next. You know, believe it or not, there's actually another thing that goes unused because of this same kind of situation. Despite it being impossible to achieve normally in the final game, by hacks, you can have up to 3 credits in the crane minigame instead of the normal 1 or 2 credits. Doing this will cause this unused number 3 sprite to appear on the machine. However, even with that extra chance, the game will only count up to 2 Kirby plushies. Hey, since we're on the HUD objects anyway, let's talk about this sprite, which shows off Kirby in a cannon. As you can guess, it was meant to be shown in that box right there, which is usually reserved for showing off uh, what ability Kirby's got or what situation Kirby's in. So was there originally a cannon ability? No. Turns out as seen in this 3DS port, and for some strange reason, the French version of the original game, it was meant to appear when Kirby jumps into a cannon, but this doesn't happen in the original release. Though it is possible to see it in the final version of the game by using the mix ability and looking at the footage frame by frame. Eh, uh, see, here it is. Next, why don't we look at some unused sprites for specific characters in Kirby's Adventure. First, let's start with the mini bosses. Poppy Bros Sr. has an unused sprite that happens to be a vertically flipped version of his death sprite. And Rolling Turtle also has an unused frame that's just his shell, probably. The most likely theory is that originally this boss could hide in his shell to block against attacks. But that's just a theory. An unused Rolling Turtle sprite theory. Thanks for- Say, you remember back when I said there were quite a few removed abilities for Kirby back early in development? Well, it turns out one of those abilities is still in the game. The shrinking ability. Though, technically it's not able to be used in the game, but all the sprites are here. To give us an idea of what this ability would have looked like in the game, Gold S on the cutting room floor made a nice animated mock-up showing Kirby shrinking and a mini Kirby walking. It's likely that this ability was replaced with the UFO one, and here's why. All of the abilities in the game are put close together in banks 8-0 through 9-9, with the shrinking one being at 8-C. Now why is that? Why is the UFO so much farther away from the rest of the abilities? And why is the scrap shrinking ability in the middle of all the other used ones? Could it be that the shrinking ability was removed later in development, and that the UFO was just added in and thusly further away from the others? We can't say for sure of course, but that does sound very, very likely. Some of you may have recognized that this shrinking ability was actually used in a later Kirby game, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror for the Game Boy Advance, as the mini ability. However, it is a bit different, as you can't do that slide attack while in the mini form, unlike the scrapped ability in Kirby's Adventure, where it looks like you could. Now, it's about time that we look at the many unused rooms in Kirby's Adventure, a vast majority of which are scrapped museum rooms. You know, the ones where powerless enemies are put on display so you can eat them alive and steal their powers? Yeah, those rooms. Turns out there are five of those that go unused. Going in order of each room's ID, room 1-4 is a nice museum featuring the chili enemy, which gives Kirby the freeze ability. While this stage is almost identical to Vegetable Valley's museum, there are a few differences. One, the enemy is different, with the final version having a sword knight giving you the sword ability, obviously, and if you didn't know that the sword wielding enemy would give you the sword ability, you've also got that huge picture above it saying sword, so it's pretty obvious what ability you get. 
except it's not completely obvious in this unused room since its ability picture is missing. In fact, every unused museum is missing those pictures as well, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The last difference you should notice in this room is that the pedestal is higher than the final version. You know what's weird though? When you exit this room, it actually takes you to the door for Orange Ocean's quick draw game. So perhaps this was where the museum was supposed to be at first, but was replaced with that quick draw minigame. Or it could also just be a coincidence, you never quite know. Let's move on to the next room, number 15. This one has a pengi which gives you the ice ability and another chili. This room is incredibly similar to Grape Garden's museum and layout, but the colors can be much different in some parts of the room. Plus, the two enemies shown off are different from the final two, and once again, the pedestals are higher in this unused room. Now, when you decide to head through that exit door, for some reason you're taken to Ice Cream Island's arena door, once again alluding to a possible location for this unused museum. Now it's time for room 16, oh boy! This one happens to be identical in every way to Butter Buildings Museum, but instead of giving you a star man that has a high jump ability, it's a twister enemy that gives you the tornado move, it was actually found in Yogurt Yard's museum in the final game. This unused stage exits in the air above Grape Garden's Crane Game, an unusual place, unless originally there used to be a museum door up there, or once again, coincidence. Room 17, the next unused museum, is almost exactly the same as Yogurt Yard's museum. It's got the same layout and colors, they both have a rocky enemy that gives you the stone ability, though they are different colors, and in fact, the unused room even exits right above Yogurt Yard's museum. However, this sparky enemy was replaced with the twister enemy in the retail version. Turns out though, this is the only museum where the sparky enemy is found. No other level in the final game uses this poor sparky in their museum. Oh, poor guy. Okay, now we've got one last unused museum room, room 136 which is almost an exact duplicate of the unused museum, room 14, except this one has Sir Kibley instead of a chili. Or technically not. See, it's using Sir Kibley sprites, but really, it's a Togizo, which gives you the needle ability. Also, it's hovering in midair, so that, that's kind of a thing. The most interesting thing about this room is the exit location. For some strange reason, every time you exit this room, you end up spawning right over the last hidden switch you hit. So if you hit the one in stage 7-6 last, you'll go there. And if you hit 5-4 switch after that, you'll head to 5-4 instead. Why? I have no idea. I mean, it's a very strange functionality to have, which makes me think it was intended. So maybe this was like a debug room to reach switches. Or maybe it really is just a coding bug. Really, you, you can't be quite sure. Turns out the room right after this one, room 137, is another unused area, except this one isn't a museum, it's an arena. Despite being unused though, there actually aren't that many differences and most of them are fairly obvious. First, Mr. Frosty is blue, so he isn't using that green palette that's seen in the final arena. The crowd also refuses to move, bunch of jerks. And not to mention, there's no maximum tomato that appears after the battle's won, so there's no reward for even winning except for the satisfaction of a hard day's work. Leaving the arena actually takes Kirby to Grape Garden's arena, which houses Bugsy in the final game, not Mr. Frosty. So perhaps Mr. Frosty was originally meant for level 4's arena instead of level 2's. Up next we've got two puzzle rooms that didn't quite make the cut, but still work perfectly-ish. The first room is room 145, and the goal, as with all other cannon puzzles, is to get the fuse lit and jump into the cannon before it fires. In this unused room though, in order to solve the puzzle, you've got to pound down the stake with the hammer ability, then before the ice block is created to block the laser's path, inhale the laser ball, steal its ability, shoot at the slope, which will bounce the laser, and light the fuse. Then all you've got to do is jump into the cannon before it fires, <laughs> easy peasy, living squeezily. If you do eventually get to that cannon in time, you'll be transported to another unused puzzle room. Or, you know, you could technically take that door too, it takes you to the same place, but you know, not my call, you do you. Speaking of that next puzzle room, it's number 146, and this time there's no cannons to be found, just two stakes that you'll have to hit. Sadly though, there's no reward to doing this puzzle. 
It looks like there would have originally been something in this hole in the ice, like a 1-up or something, but it's not there now. In order to solve this puzzle, you've got to hit the spike on the top, which will destroy a bunch of ice blocks, allowing the prize to fall, potentially, into this bottomless pit. So you've got to run down there as fast as possible to grab the reward before it falls into endlessness. That's it. But I'm sure you're wondering what that stake below does. Turns out it does nothing but destroy the box below it, killing you. Literally, that's all it's used for, killing you. Next, let's take a look at some incredibly interesting debug rooms, starting with room A8, an actual hub stage for all the rest of those debug rooms. The first thing that caught my eye here are these ladder pieces just above the bottom doors. Turns out these pieces actually represent each of the door's numbers in binary, with the bottom piece being 1, the middle being 2, and the top being 4. Unsurprisingly, if you add them all up, from left to right the doors are numbered 1 through 7. However, doors 6 and 7 don't work, meaning that the rooms they were likely attached to were removed sometime throughout development. The rest of them work very well though. Oh, and not to mention, there's that door on the top left, which believe it or not, leads to another hub room. This one has 8 doors though, an entirely different and very nice looking room, I must say. Going through each of these reveals that they lead to the hubs for each of the 7 levels in the game. For example, that door on the top left leads to level 1, Vegetable Valley. The one below that is level 5, Yogurt Land. And the bottom right door, well, actually that one does not work. Some think it would have led back to the main debug hub, which I agree is very likely, but for whatever reason, there's no link now. So at this point, why don't we head back and check out each of those rooms in the debug hub starting from left to right. The first one turns out to be the Fountain of Dreams, which is copied from the point it's shown after the credits, but before the star rod falls onto the fountain. It's so much of a duplicate that even the music is exactly the same, and most agree that this place was likely used for testing but it's unknown exactly how. The next room over is actually a bunch of different rooms strung together by doors that eventually lead back to the hub. Turns out these aren't just some random rooms though. They actually copy the exact layout of a few Meta Knight rooms. For example, the first is a copy of level 4-5, the second level 5-4, the next level 6-6, six, six, and then level 3-4, and level 2-3. There are three more rooms that are shown after these, but from what I can see, they don't match any Meta Knight stages you can see in the final game. So perhaps there were going to be more that were scrapped. Alright, next door. This room should look very familiar to you, as it's the same as the tutorial stage that shows up if you stay on the title screen for too long. But while the rooms are the same, the enemy sprites don't look quite right when you make it about halfway through. That's because the tutorial is hard-coded to load different enemy sprites, starting with Pengi here, which, if you play the stage, instead looks like a Poppy Bros Jr. turning into a tomato and shooting eyeballs. See, the thing is, when playing the level normally, the functionality to load different enemy sprites halfway through a room is lost, and thusly, the new sprites aren't loaded, and the enemies look really strange, like Bugsy being a bunch of cannons with chopped up enemy pieces. By the way, once you get to the end, turns out the warp star doesn't take you to the tutorial screen as it would if the computer was playing through the stage. Instead, it takes you to room 13A, a more difficult version of the Poppy Bros Senior mini boss. Well, then again, not really, because you just bounce around this room and then leave on the warp star just after getting there. After that scene, you're taken to the next room, Room number 13B, which is the same layout as the last room, but this time it's a harder version of the Rolling Turtle mini boss. The problem is, the star takes you right below the stage, thusly killing you. But it, it's fine, everything's fine, you just respawn back in this room. And actually, those rooms, the ones we just talked about, there's actually a lot more to learn about them because there are actually four of them. They all look the same with that whacked out background but each of them have a different, more difficult version of a specific mini-boss. The first is Bugsy, then Poppy Bro Sr., Rolling Turtle, and lastly, Mr. TikTok. specifically in that order. Heading through the doors in each room will take you to the next boss, except for the last one, which leads you all the way back to the debug hub, 
and it turns out you can actually get to the first of these rooms with Bugsy by heading into door number five in the hub. Now, you know what? You're probably wondering what door number four goes to because I just skipped it. Well, actually, that heads to that cannon puzzle we talked about earlier. It's all coming around nicely, isn't it? One neat little package. Well, we've gotten through all of those unused rooms. Last but not least, we've got an unused song that we've just got to listen to. It actually happens to be a quote-unquote remastered version of the original Kirby's Dreamland theme from the Game Boy. I say we listen to both the original and the unused remastered version and compare the quality. Shall we? So that's the development of Kirby's Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure. I just want to say thank you all so much for watching and especially thank you to Arvid Olsen. He's the guy who orchestrated the Kirby's Adventure soundtrack that was used in this video. It sounds fantastic. I have a link right, right here, right around this part, which brings you to a playlist of all the songs that was used in the video. Check them out. They're great. Put them on your phone. Listen them while working out. Do whatever you want. I also want to say another thing, we have a second channel, and by we, I mean me, she says, and A plus start. We've all just born this channel called Game Club Podcast. It's a great place. We take a week to play a video game. We review it in a podcast kind of like format, around 50 minutes. It's basically your weekly 50 minute fix of all of us together into one lovely little channel. So guys, I just want to say that we got a great month planned for Beta 64. Next week, I have an interview with the voice of GLaDOS. Yeah, Ellen McLean. She talked to me, little old me. She talked to me. And we talked all about the development of Portal. We talked about how she got into voice acting. Get excited for that. There's a lot of good stuff, including some stuff that may never have been known before. Mm hmm. Anyway, thanks everyone. There's links over here to more videos. There's a link over here to my channel if you want to subscribe. If you want to do that, that's great. I'm going to leave. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time.